Welcome everyone. Can you hear me? God bless you. Um, this is about the author. Day by day, 123 Pennsylvania volunteers. Christopher D. George, a graduate of both the University of Cincinnati and the University of Pittsburgh, teaches in the Upper St. Clair School District near Pittsburgh. An avid genealogist, he has spent over 20 years researching his great great granddaughter in the time he served as a member of the 123rd Pennsylvania Volunteers. His book, Day by Day, which I guess is over there, right? For sale? For sale? Day by Day, 123rd Pennsylvania Volunteers received the William Rimmel Award in 2017 from the Allegheny City Society of Pittsburgh. Mr. George has given numerous talks and written articles about the men of the 123rd for both the Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Previously, he published a family history titled The George Memory Book in 2008. Chris lives with his wife and three children in South Fayette. He can be contacted at and I have a time contact. I think he has cards too, right? Okay, here we go, here we go. This is the third time I try to get him in because we have to keep canceling him. <laughs> well, it is their time to charm, uh, as they say. We were originally scheduled to get together about a year ago, I think it was. Yes, a year. Of course, we all know what happened then. And then we were scheduled to get together in November, and cases spiked. Cancel that, and here we are, third time. It's good to finally be here. Uh, thanks to Mary and to Rosemary for uh, inviting me to be here and to have that opportunity. Um, and the little research that I've done about your organization is quite impressive, really, what you've done in a little bit over 20 years. Um, and I've also enjoyed reading a little bit, uh, I think it's Joseph and John Euler's writing. Uh, in the, especially as part about the Civil War soldiers, which I think from the original area were 1st PA Cavalry, I believe, and then I think it was the Company D, the 149, a lot of original connections. Um, so I think it just goes to show how much for organizations like this are so vital uh, to preserving the local history. So keep up the great work. Appreciate that. Thank you for having me here tonight. Well, my intention over the next 45 minutes or so is really to tell you two stories. Uh, the first of which is how I stumbled upon the 123rd uh, a number of years ago. And the other one is really their story and how their eventful time transpired in the Civil War. And I'll be telling you about it, but also be using their words to tell you about it. Let them do some of the talking. Uh, but before I get to any of that, and I've already talked to, to Bill back there a little bit, but I'm, just, I'm always curious whenever I get to talk, I'd like to ask, does, does anybody know if they had a relative that fought in the Civil War? So, oh, I like the hands up. Do you know the, what, I mean, what's the relationship and what regiment? I have a great grandfather. He was in twice, once as a volunteer on Stratford. He ended up in Sherman's study knife. Right after the big battle of Bentonville, which you're familiar with, uh, he ended up with his 79th regiment the second time around. The second time. Around. The first time was 158th. So, and what, out of what state? Well, he's from uh, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Okay, so he's he yes. served both times in North Carolina. Okay, so he had such a good time the first time. With Sherman's 79th, around the time of Bentonville. Okay, that's great. Twice. Yeah. At uh, wherever it was that uh, Joe Johnson's mother. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. You know, you had a relative that you don't know. Yes, I don't know. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know. That's more common than you think, yes. to be honest. Yes. Yeah, it's more common. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. My sister married um, a direct descendant of Gugner Ward. Okay. Okay, 
So we've got some Gettysburg connections there. Yeah. So we've got Sherman yeah. connections. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's so great. If you're interested in more this information, um, the, uh, the, the um, soldiers and sailors. Thank you. Um, my sister has mined all of this paraphernalia and stuff. Okay, his relics. Including the sword. Um, to them for, you know, long-term, and photographs, family photographs, and everything, and it's, uh, it's there, it's seen. That's okay. Very impressive, all right, so that's an impressive group we already have. I actually know about five more of them. Okay. From my mother's family, okay. from my family, okay. from my mother's family, and the other four are from my father's family, okay. but they were great, great uncles. Like that kind of but you're aware of it. You know I'm the aware names. Of it. Know it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's wonderful. I think they're over Chancellorsville. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about Chancellorsville. Oh, well, thank you. All right, anybody else? All right, Bill was telling me uh, his great great grandfather was in the 46th, yes. but he was he was upper management. He was a brigadier general. Yeah, that's great. All right, but well, you were definitely one of the leading groups as far as the Good connection to that. Well, my interest in the 123rd uh, really started out very innocently. Growing up and into my early adulthood, I didn't have a whole lot of interest in history or family history. But that changed rather dramatically in the spring of 1993. And at that time, I was at the funeral of my paternal grandfather. And I learned on that day that the woman I had known my entire life as my grandmother was not my biological grandmother. My father was barely 12 years old when his mother died of intestinal cancer in the mid-1950s. And my grandfather, in an effort to stabilize his young family, would court and eventually marry what I now believe was actually his high school sweetheart. And they reconnected at their 30th high school reunion. And I believe that the two of them really decided, because she had not been previously married, they decided to pick up the pieces of their lives and just simply move forward. And so Alma Golden George, my biological grandmother was never talked about. So you can imagine the shock of that revelation, coupled with the emotion of being at the funeral and losing my grandfather. And what it did is it ignited within me an interest to know my family history. And it really, in all honesty, was my first step leading me to be here in front of you tonight, all those many years ago. But once my genealogical flame was, was ignited, and, and I, I know people sometimes find this strange, but I really consider myself a genealogist more than a historian. Uh, I use the history to understand the genealogy. And um, once that flame was ignited, it wasn't long before I learned that I had a relative that fought in the American Civil War. And that was my great-great-grandfather. And it wasn't long before I ordered his pension files from the National Archives. And the information that was included in those files was pure genealogical gold. And again, maybe some of you who have, you know you have the Civil War relatives, you've seen those documents. And they have first names, last names, offspring, death dates, marriage dates. There was just all kinds of answers to so many questions that I had about my family. But if any of you are genealogists, and I imagine there are quite a few in here, as I saw you looking at old pictures this evening and, and doing some of that, uh, you know that answers only lead to more questions. And the sad truth for my family is, is that no letters, no, excuse me, no journal, no relics, not even a wartime photograph, had trickled down through the generations and into my hands for my great-great-grandfather. The 
This is one of the few photographs that I do have. And I think, I feel like that was taken for his 75th birthday. So in an effort to understand what his experiences were like, you, know, you can certainly go to some of the history books and you can find out where they were mustered in and the battles they fought at and where they camped and those kind of things. But I wanted that soldier perspective from the ground level. And where I started to do research was in the Carnegie Library of Oakland, um, back before the internet. And I <laughs> spent some time, many, many, many hours, looking at microfilm of old Pittsburgh newspapers in the 1860s. And I was really looking for any shred of information about the 123rd. And what I found in those papers fascinated me because there was article after article after article about the 123rd. And what I've since come to learn, if you notice the quote from the local historian, Arthur Fox, is that of all the regiments that were in any way connected to Allegheny County, historians consider there to be truly two regiments that are truly considered purely Allegheny County regiments, meaning that you know, a regiment is typically a thousand men made up of 10 companies of 100 men each. And there are only two regiments they consider to have a majority of every company being from Allegheny County. The first was the 102nd Pennsylvania Volunteers, and they were a three-year regiment. And the other one is the 123rd, and they were a nine-month regiment. So the papers had a vested interest in following this collection of 1,000 men because they were local. They are truly local. And inspired by all of these finds and all this information, I then broadened my search and started to go to places like the Heinz History Center and their wonderful library and archives and the Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia and, of course, the State Archives in Harrisburg and many, many other local history societies and libraries much like yours. And it's important and it's meaningful, the work that you do and those places do, because they truly preserve our history. And through my interactions with all those librarians and archivists and historians, I was able to meet these five soldiers. And as the quote at the top, I think, really captures Really, the only reason we're here tonight is because these five men took the time to write down their thoughts, to capture what was happening in the moment, what they were observing and feeling. And then their families made the effort to preserve those words, and then made the effort to get it in some kind of historical repository so that myself, 140, 150 years later, could read that and learn from it. So, let me introduce you to these five men here. The first one is Private Matthew Borland, and he, for tonight's purposes, he's our local boy. He was a 25-year-old farmer from Cecil. If you go out Route 50, you will drive right by where the Borland family farm used to be, uh, not that far into Cecil. And he had relatives that fought in the American the Revolutionary War, he had relatives that participated in the Whiskey Rebellion, and he had a number of relatives that fought in the Civil War. One of which was his same age uncle, Private Mark Kelso. He had deep South Bay roots. They were actually both in Company G of the 123rd. They shared a tent, they were messmates throughout the whole time they were together. Next is Reverend Henry Chapman, and he was the minister of the Beaver Street Methodist Episcopal Church. And that church, of course, is no longer there, but it was, it was located in what we now call the Mexican War Streets of the North Side, if you're familiar with that. And he was 30 years old and was married to Agnes Stahl, and they actually had two young children at the time that he was chosen to be the chaplain of the regiment. Of the five men on that screen, at the time of the enlistment, he was the only one that had children. Which uh, I know from reading his memoir, made his departure and 
distance from his family even harder than for some of these other guys. In the middle there is Private Alexander Altsman. And then you'll notice that his photograph, of course, is much later in life. And that will become a little bit more important here in just a bit. But at the time of his enlistment, he was 18 years old. And he was living in Allegheny City, which of course is today's north side. And he was a salesman. He worked at the R.C. Lewis Boot and Shoe Store, which was located on Wood Street, downtown Pittsburgh. So he would walk across what's now the Clemente Bridge from Allegheny City into Pittsburgh to work when he uh, enlisted and became part of Company C. And this is actually, uh, I just received this photo within the last year or so from his relative, who actually still has the original journal that he kept, which I'll read something tonight. Next we have Private James Ross, and he was a 21-year-old blacksmith from Manchester, which of course today is part of the North Side. And he had a younger brother who was also in the 123rd. His name was Emmett Ross, but he was in Company E, so the two brothers must have signed up at different times. One got into Company G, one got into Company E. And of course, if you noticed on the previous screen, my great-great-grandfather, John Armstrong George, he was in Company E as well. And the last one looks like his name got cut off a little bit there. That's Reverend John Barr Clark. And he was the minister of the Second United Presbyterian Church in Allegheny City. He was 34 years old. He was married to Lydia Collins. And they did not have any children. At the time that the regiment formed, in the summer of 1862. And um, their words are what I'll be sharing some with you tonight to get a sense of what this was like from that ground level view. Well, the question then becomes, what caused these five men and roughly the thousand other men, what caused them to become part of the 123rd? And to understand that, we have to understand what was going on in Pittsburgh, in Allegheny City, in the north, in the summer of 1862. And at that time, the Peninsular Campaign had failed. And the Lincoln administration was fully realizing that this was not going to be an easy conquest of the South. And as a result, Lincoln puts out a call for an additional 300,000 men at a term of three-year enlistment. And every state and every county was given a quota that they must raise uh, to, to, based on their population to fulfill that rather large number. But almost immediately, the governor, Andrew Curtin of Pennsylvania, and several other northern governors realized this is going to be a tall task, in that at this time, the young men of the north were not as vigorous and as not as forthcoming in their excitement to enlist as they were a year prior after Sport Sumter in that spring and summer of 1861. Um, much like in talking with Bill, his relative was part of that first 75,000 in 1861. You get to the summer of 1862, and things haven't gone splendidly well for the North. There's some rumor of immorality within the army. There's rumors of poor generalship. There's some hesitancy in the northern troops. So the governors approach the Lincoln administration, making their case and say, it's going to be extremely difficult to raise 300,000 men for a three-year term of enlistment. Can we shorten the term of enlistment? The Lincoln administration kind of bats this around. And they come back and they say, okay, we will make nine-month regiments. Now, I don't have any research that documents this, but I've often said to myself, why nine months? Why wouldn't you go from three months or three years to one year? And I've come to believe that it has everything to do with the agricultural calendar. That if these young men would sign up in the summer of 62, they'd be back in the spring of 63 and not lose a year of crops. So it was an incentive for them to enlist. Well, as you can see, Allegheny County was expected to raise 1,500 men, Pennsylvania 2,100 men. So that's roughly 21 regiments from the state of Pennsylvania. 
Well, after the Lincoln administration agrees to this, there are war meetings all over the state, and all over the North, really, recruitment meetings. And one of the largest that happened in Pennsylvania happened in what we now call West Park, which, if you know where the National Aviary is there in Allegheny City, North Side, that's where this was taking place. And they had four different speaker stands set up. They had bands playing, they had all kind of bunting and patriotic regalia. One of the speaker stands was completely in German to tailor to the many German immigrants that were living in Allegheny City, and that roughly in that area as well. And Governor Curtis spoke, and there were military leaders, and religious leaders, and political leaders, all urging the men of Pittsburgh and Allegheny, City and Allegheny County to enlist. And the results were okay. The enlistments were there, but it wasn't really at the pace that they had hoped for. Well, not too long after this meeting, the Lincoln administration reverses course. And they say nine months is simply too short of a term for we're going to have a mass influx of troops. So they put a hard stop on when the nine-month regiments could form, and that was August 10th. So if you signed up and your regiment formed before, by or before August 10th, you were good to go. If you signed up on August 11th or your regiment didn't form until after August 10th, you were then in a three-year regiment. Then, a couple days later, the Lincoln administration says, oh, by the way, if you don't meet your quota, we're going to implement a draft, and we're going to tell you what three-year regiment you're in. So all of these forces were swirling around Pittsburgh in the north in this late summer of 1862. And into this vortex stops Reverend, or I should say, steps, steps, excuse me, Reverend Clark. And he, uh, as I said, was at the second UP of Allegheny City. He'd only been there since the summer of 1860. He's only been there for about two years. He'd actually been previously in Cannonsburg. He was in the Presbyterian Church down in Cannonsburg. But in the pulpit in early August, he says to his congregation, I am uh, going to have a war meeting next Tuesday, the coming Tuesday, in the basement of our church. And at that meeting, he stood up and said, my goal is to raise a hundred good Christian men from our congregation, and I want to be their captain. A company has a hundred men and is led by a captain. Well, the reaction to this, and he signed the top of the luster roll with a big flourish. He was quite the character. I could, I could present to you for a couple hours about his life and what he was like. But within 36 hours, they had 100 men on that muster roll. Another company starts to form and fills up. A third company forms and starts to fill up. And at this same time, what happens is the Pittsburgh papers get a hold of this. And several articles appear in the papers, and they're basic message is, okay, for those young men who have been out there, you've been hesitant with all these rumors swirling about poor generalship and immorality, now's your chance. Here's a man of God. He's here as a natural leader. Now's your time to sign up. So that message was broadcast all over Allegheny County. Within 72 hours, they had a thousand men sign up. These are the men that became the 123rd. So, after, and you'll notice, one day before the closing of that nine-month window is when they finally got their, all the signatures in place and were ready to go. Well, after this happened, they had a couple of weeks, and of course there were troops there, I think across the state of Pennsylvania, there were 16 nine-month regiments. So, massive influx of men. Harrisburg was really overwhelmed. So they hung out in Pittsburgh, did some drilling, tried to, you know, act like soldiers, if you will. Some of, the, some of them talked about, yeah, was, we went to the park, we did some drilling today, and then we went to go get ice cream. Uh, but eventually on August 20th, they do depart Pittsburgh on a train. They travel to Harrisburg to get mustered in and get their uniforms and the accoutrements. And then they take a train to Baltimore and then down to Washington, D.C. and into the field of battle. Well, now that we know 
how the wrench was formed. I wanted to show you this. First of all, that's, that, that might possibly be the only picture that exists of the Second United Presbyterian Church. Uh, a friend of mine at the Allegheny City Society found that. And that's where, the basement of that church where it was formed. And if you, of course, if you know where PNC Park is, that church used to be about two blocks north of PNC Park. If you're looking at what is now Allegheny Center, the front right of that complex is where this church used to be. It was torn down, I think, in the early 1960s when they were building Allegheny Center. But that's where it all took place. So here's the question. Who were these guys? And the graphic that you see on the screen this comes from a, words, a website called Wordle. And if you're not familiar with it, what you do is you, you basically enter a bunch of text, and it will generate a graphic with the most frequent words being the largest on the screen. So what I did is I typed in the occupation of each of the thousand plus soldiers at the time of enlistment. And no surprise, farmer comes out on top as you can see right there in the middle. And if you look, of course, over to the right, about 13% of the regiment were farmers. So it's about 130 farmers. You might remember that Private Ross was a blacksmith, about 50 blacksmiths in this regiment. And my great-great-grandfather was a bricklayer, about 25 bricklayers in the regiment. And of course, some of them you can easily read, and there are many of them that you can't read at all because there were so few of those occupations in there. But when I, I you kind of pull the lens back and look at that graphic, it struck me that they were prepared to deal with anything when you think about it. You know, here you've got a number of butchers, about 40 butchers in this regiment. Do you think you're going to need a butcher when all the government's giving you is stale crackers and watery coffee to eat. And there's a little pig over there that sure looks tasty. Absolutely. Do you think you're going to need the skills of a shoemaker when those boots blow out? Absolutely. Do you think you'll need a blacksmith maybe when some of the wagon trains start to break down? They had the skills to handle everything that was thrown at them. And I'm imagining those regiments were like this. But it just really struck me that the, the broad spectrum of skills that they had at their fingertips there. And finally, the average age was under 23 years. There were a few guys who were in their 30s, and even a couple in their early 40s, but a majority were very young. A third of the regiment was 18 years old. So they really were boys. Really were boys. And roughly 90% of the regiment is from Allegheny County. 50% was from Allegheny City. And no, no surprise, that's where Reverend Clark's church was. All right, well, their time in the Civil War, I think, can be argued as really some of the darkest days for the North. Not long after they enlisted and entered into the field of battle, the Battle of the Second Bull Run happens. Tragic loss for the North. Antietam, two weeks later. Basically a stalemate, but horrendous losses. Still the bloodiest day of fighting in American history. And any of their naive thoughts about war were shattered very quickly, as they were not engaged in these battles because they were just simply too raw of troops. But they witnessed the carnage. And in some cases, I think they actually helped bury the dead. So, they really got a, a clean picture of what they were in for very quickly. And their major battle that year in 1862 was Fredericksburg. And if you know anything about the Battle of Fredericksburg, and I was talking to Barry, was telling me about that her favorite trip is to go to Gettysburg, and to, and to Harbor's Ferry, and Antietam. And the sad thing is, is, I don't hear many people say, I like going to Fredericksburg. And part of the reason is because it was a horrible northern loss. We all like to go to Gettysburg and celebrate that. But if you haven't been to Fredericksburg, it's a great battle site as well. They have a great bookstore there, they have great uh, park rangers, they have great, great tours. But it was a disaster for the North. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Yes, Karen. Chris, if, um, even though the Reverend Clark 
He became a colonel. Yeah. No military, no prior military experience. Okay. He's now in charge of a thousand men. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yes. Sir. Uh, can I ask a question about the pitch that David Clark made? Was it to free the slaves or was it to reunite the Union? Or, or why were these people trying to say? Uh from what I have read, his pitch was we need to defend the Union. That was his. Now, I will tell you, knowing a little bit about him, he was a very staunch anti-slavery. That was just sort of baked into his DNA. So he had that within him. Now, did he mention that? I don't know at the time of that, that talk. But it was definitely, we need to rise up and defend the Union. Keep the country together. Well, after the Battle of Fredericksburg, and I'll talk about that in just a bit, both armies go into their winter quarters and really just wait for the winter weather to pass, right, back in the 1860s. To have an active campaign in the middle of the winter is just something that was very hard to do. The spring thaws come, the Chancellor's Bill happens, and again, another northern loss. So all throughout this, Lincoln is dispatching generals, McClellan flames out, he gets rid of him, Burnside comes in, he flames out. And this is all before Grant Gettysburg happens. So they served during a time when really the, the outcome of the war was very much up in the air. And these were, you know, it was northern loss after Robert E. Lee was just eating their lunch in almost every battle. And Lincoln was looking for that, that one general who was going to turn things around. Now these guys, 123rd, their term of enlistment ended in May of 63. Now, some of them did re up and they were in Gettysburg and they fought in all the different battles. But all of their time is before that turning point. And if you know anything about June of 1863 in Pittsburgh, it was an absolute time of panic. You know, Bill, you were talking about what was going on in Harrisburg. They knew that Lee was going to attack in Pennsylvania. They didn't know where, but there were a lot of people that thought he was going to be in Pittsburgh. And they shut down the city for three days to build fortifications all around the city. In preparation for that. Now, of course, he attacks at Gettysburg, and that changes the war. But their term is before all of that. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about Fredericksburg. To understand really any civil war battle, any, any battle ever, you have to understand the topography. And if you can imagine where you're sitting is the city of Fredericksburg. And over there by Karen is, let's say the hallway is the Rappahannock River, which is in the front of the city. And then to that, on the other side of that river are the hills to the north. And that's where the northern troops were. It's real easy. Northern hills were the north troops, southern hills were the southern troops. And for those northern troops to attack, they had to come down that hill, cross the Rappahannock on pontoon bridges, come through the city, all under view of a heavily entrenched Southern army. And you can imagine what they were lobbing into them as they, as soon as they would see them come marching down the hills, they'd fire up the cannon. Well, those troops would have to then come through the city, come out the back of the city, and behind that was this wide open field, which you can see them charging on. Here's the Southern position, and I just heard mention somebody knew that there was this stone wall at the base of what's called Maurice Heights. And of course, up here, heavily entrenched cannon for, this, for Lee and his army. And as you can see from the numbers, wave after wave of northern troops tried to take that hill. And nobody got as close, some accounts say that somebody got, they got as close as 50 yards from that wall, the base of that hill, others say 100 yards at best. But it was just an absolute slaughter. And the The picture that you see here, of course, is a, a great representation of just wave after wave. And I wanted to share with you some of the words of the soldiers that I mentioned and what they experienced. 
dexterous enough to handle the microphone and the book at the same time. <clears throat> so the first of these is from Private Ross. He was the blacksmith from Manchester, 21 years old. And he's writing this on December 12th. As you can see up at the top, the, the battle officially started on December 11th. But the, 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 on December 12th, it's sort of the, real, the first day that the fighting really picks up. And he's writing this over at these hills. He's waiting for the 123rd to be ordered down that hill, across the river, through the city, and to attack. Here's what he writes. It says, this morning, we were awakened at 4 a.m. In quite a hurry, we marched a mile for the purpose of crossing the river and formed our crossing as fast as possible. We hear an occasional shell along the river. Large force is yet to cross over. Report says that over 50,000 of our troops have crossed today. But I think that is a little exaggerated. It's now 4 p.m. and we're laying in battle line and we have no probability of getting across today. We filed into a pine forest close by and bivouacked for the night. Remember, this is the middle of December, so the sun's setting really early. Tonight reminds me of some sketches of the Revolutionary War. Bivouacked in the thick forest, our arms stacked in battle line, the boys all sitting around respective fires built at the root of some large trees. It is quite ancient looking. I love that image. There they are just sitting there. And they knew that their next, really the next day was going to be their day. Their first true test of battle. Well, December 13th dawns, this is what Private Altman writes. He's, yeah, 18 years old, shoe salesman. He writes this on December 13th. Fredericksburg, we crossed over the river today. The ball and shell were flying through the town, tearing through our ranks. So again, they're coming through in plain sight of all that fire. William Worthington was struck in the head with a solid shot and was only stunned. Our division was put in the fight about sundown. I was the fifth one in our company that was wounded. I made my way to the hospital and got my wound dressed, but could not get the mini ball extracted, as the doctor could not find it. So for Private Altsman, he's one of those men charging that wall, and he takes a direct shot into his right hip. Somehow, he scurries off the battlefield and gets to the field hospital. They can't find the mini ball. And he does not have surgery to remove that manual until 47 days after the battle. How he survived, I have no clue. But that's why I pointed out his picture. He lived a full life. He died at 77. And he somehow survived this. Now, he, I believe his gait was affected for the rest of his life. I think he had kind of an itch in his, his gait. But somehow he survived. Well, our local guy, Private Borland, who wrote just an exquisite journal. He is obviously a very learned man. Uh, he writes, you know, some of these journals that you find, they're those sort of couple of words a day journal, maybe a sentence or two. He wrote in paragraphs, and he had the eye of a farmer. He would describe the landscape, and he would notice the crops, and he was comparing what he saw in Virginia to what he knew of in Pittsburgh and in Pennsylvania. And he actually, in his journal, he refers to Miller's Run. He says, I, I, I miss the Sundays of just enjoying the Sabbath near Miller's Run. So here's what he had to say. And this is written on, it's the evening of December 15th into the 16th. So what has happened is the North has, has suffered just tremendous losses. And General Burnside, who was in charge of the Army of the Potomac at this time, he's trying to decide, okay, do we renew the attack on the 16th? And I think he really wanted to. But luckily, his generals talked him out of it and said, look at the reports. I mean, we have just sacrificed way too many men already. So the decision was luckily made for them to retreat out of the city, back over that bridge, and into those northern hills. And that's when Borland was writing this. He says, I am entirely satisfied with our experience in war. It commenced raining shortly after we started over the river and made it very disagreeable marching. So to add insult to injury, they've just sacrificed all these men. They're in miserable shape. And as they start to retreat, it starts to pour on them. 
The rain ceased about the time we arrived at camp. I received a letter from home which afforded me peculiar pleasure. Now that the battle is over, I must say that the horrors of war, to be realized, must be seen. Well, Colonel Clark, as he did throughout the entire time the 123rd was in the, in the Civil War, he wrote letters home to the Pittsburgh papers trying to keep the families and friends somewhat informed. And in doing the paper, the newspaper research, it was flabbergasting to me, living in modern society, how long it took for information, truthful information, to get back to the northern home frame. And he made every effort to, to try to keep the families informed. And he penned this letter on December 18th, so three days after the end of the battle. But the letter was not published in the Pittsburgh papers until Christmas Day. So, as I read this, think to yourself what it would have been like to wake up on Christmas morning and see this in the paper. This is some of what he wrote. It says, another battle has been fought, but glorious victory did not perch on the standard of the Union Army. Last Saturday was a day of terror and fearful destruction along the southern bank of the Rappahannock. From noon till night, the roar of battle never ceased. Thousands of brave men lost life and limbs. Of the losses on our side as yet, I presume there is no accurate account. From what I saw, I know they were great. As far as my eyes could reach along the lines, I saw dead men lying. Just as the battle line when we fought, they lay I have thus far desisted from my any mention of the disasters resulting to the regiment. This to me is too sad a task. At the earliest moment possible, I obtained a list of the killed and wounded, forwarded for publication, and the list I have since learned is pretty accurate, and I hope that near this it has been published the information of anxious friends. How their hearts must bleed. Oh God, pity the bereaved, the soldier's widow and fatherless children. Let heaven's healing balm soothe and heal every heart wrung with pain and broken with anxiety. To know the fact that your friends fought bravely and shed their life's blood to perpetuate liberty in the land is an honor that will never perish, but it won't replace the dear lost ones, or make your home ring with joy like the return and presence of those you much love. Jesus only can comfort in an hour like this. He only can heal the broken heart and turn your sadness into gladness. A good preacher in that, can't you? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, um, after this battle, they would go into winter quarters. And of course, the new year would happen. And I, I just, I think this image, which was drawn by Thomas Nass, a very famous illustrator for Harper's Weekly, just captures what that holiday season had to be like on the northern home front. You have you know, just the prayers of those at home, the return of the soldiers, and of course the soldiers in the field, praying that they make it home to see the families be back what it wants well after they go into winter quarters of course chancellors are over in the spring happens and the 123rd their time of service was actually uh, over during what was chancellors they actually stayed on a little bit longer to finish out the battle and eventually make the slow trip back to Harrisburg and be mustered out and back to, to Pittsburgh and you can imagine how the papers were interested in their return to Pittsburgh. Uh, there were multiple articles about the planning that was happening, and they actually, this is the route that they're going to march when they return from, the, the, from Harrisburg, and this is when the train's coming, and of course that was delayed, and all these different things, but eventually, of course, they did arrive. And this is some of what appeared, this was in the Pittsburgh Post on May 18th, 1863. 
says the 123rd Regiment of Pennsylvania Volunteers under the command of Colonel John B. Clark arrived in this city on Saturday, May 16th on a special train from Harrisburg. The streets in the vicinity of the depot were thronged with thousands of men, women, and children, all on tiptoe of expectation. At length, the whistle of the locomotive was heard, and as the engine showed itself around the curve above the depot, hundreds of voices exclaimed, There's the train! Here they come! And other shouts, which soon spread throughout the vast crowd, throwing it into a state of excitement and confusion. Gradually, the train approached, crowded with soldiers. Every car window had a head and shoulders thrust through it, and the platforms were crowded to suffocation. The train moved slowly on through the immense concourse of people on either side, and every eye was strained to get a glimpse of familiar features. At length, the train stopped, and confusion ensued. Such running, shoving, jumping, crashing, hunting, handshaking, hugging, and kissing we never witnessed before. Every man, woman, and child seemed to be in search of a soldier whom they could take to their embrace, and although all did not succeed, it was not for want of trying. These scenes did not last long, as the order to fall in was given, and generally obeyed. A great many, however, hooked ladies on their arms and disappeared, home being foremost in their minds and hearts. Well, as they disembarked from the train to this wonderful reception, the regiment would march down Liberty Avenue to Pittsburgh's City Hall, which at this time was in Market Square. They're received in City Hall. They are, of course, some speeches uh, given, welcoming them back, and commending them for their service to the country. And most importantly, they were fed. They got to sit down and have a meal, which they were very excited about. Once this reception was home, they then marched out of City Hall, out of Market Square, and they went across the Clemente Bridge and into Allegheny City. They then would march back to where the mass meeting was, West Park, again, near the National Aviary, and there, Allegheny City welcomed them back home. And there were definitely cheers given for the regiment and cheers given for Colonel Clark. And Colonel Clark was asked to give a speech, and he basically stood up and said, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Thank you for the welcome home. It's, now that we know, we have felt this all the way through our nine months, that we have not been forgotten by Pittsburgh and Allegheny City. And this reception home proves that once again. Well, under to Colonel Clark, the men of the regiment had taken up a collection and had asked somebody back home to purchase an engraved silver watch as their token of thank you to his generalship and his leadership. And this was presented to him at this time. And that prompted him to actually stand up and talk. And this is some of what he said. Preachers gotta talk. They can't be held silent too. This Colonel Clark, Colonel Clark, excuse me, remarked for the unexpected token of regard. He tendered his sincere thanks, and he needed no such testimonial to assure him of their affection and the regard for him. This peace would increase his high esteem for those who had followed him during peril and fatigue. The men had his sincere gratitude for all their good conduct in the camp and in the field. He wished no better, no worse thing than that the blessing of our common Father. May he whose hand scatters the drops of rain liberally reward you each for, uh, for all of your toil and uphold you amid all your sorrows. May his presence ever go with you. I wish one and all, officers and men, the blessing of God. A minute afterwards, the colonel said, Now, gentlemen, <coughs> You may consider yourselves among <coughs> men. The escort then moved off, the crowd dispersed. Well, before this crowd disperses, I'd like to once again say thank you for Rosemary's perseverance in making this happen tonight for the third time. And of course, for you coming tonight to learn a little bit about these local men and what they went through 
uh, again, from a soldier's eye perspective. Uh, if you or anyone you know is interested in learning more about the 123rd, of course, tonight is really just a snapshot. But uh, if you would, I certainly have hope for you if you're interested. Um, it's available on Amazon, and of course, I did I have a limited number of copies here tonight, um, selling them for $22. But regardless of that, thank you for coming, and keep up the great work that all local historical societies like yours do in preserving our history. So thank you, and God bless. Do you have any questions? I'll try to answer what she said. Yes. Uh, and I'm just saying, Claire, the Gilfilla House was built dating. 57. So, and if you haven't been there, the furnishing, many of the furnishings are from prior to the Civil War All right. in that house. Uh, also, the auxiliary parking lot for uh, Westminster Church and the driveway, the back driveway leading into high school up in St. Clair, uh, that's where uh, Captain uh, Espy lived. Was that his? I know he was from St. Clair. Yeah, that, that was his home. Okay. And of course, in Carnegie, they have the uh, uh, Captain yeah. SP post in the uh, library. Talk oh, about a true gem. You know, that, that has to be, if not the best, one of the best in the country preserved. This is such a great story. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I know, uh, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of work with the St. Clair Historical Society uh, on a, another project. But um, yeah, again, there's another local agency that's doing just, uh, just a great job preserving what's there. Oh, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Um, I do the historical calendar for historical society, and um, for 2021, uh, July 4th is for Civil War veterans from here. Um, uh, with the uh, new 48 star flag in 1912. I do, and I can show you that. Those are the Bridgeville soldiers? Yes. Okay. They were actually uh, up the St. Clair. Is that the 149? I feel like a lot of the Bridgeville. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. This is just a picture, and it's, um, it's Andy Rankin. Uh, baby Bowler, John Morris, and David Crump. And they are. I'll have to come take a look at that. Yeah. Sure. So those four gentlemen. Where did you find that picture? It's in our archives. Is that right? Yeah. Huh. I mean, their names, you know, I reference them. That's great. And what's going on. But, uh, Yes, so uh, anyway, we had our, you know, our little group there. Yeah. And, uh, but there, there was an awful lot of This area never turned away with wars. <laughs> they had to that's, that's a good turn phrase. I like that. I mean, they, well, uh, you know, they could, uh, one, of the, the, one of the first gentlemen that uh, died from this area he was in, uh, in the Juno. With you know, five brothers, and then he was the first one to die. Which was really um, I mentioned Private Borland, yeah. who was in Cecil. Right. His family, he was actually, when he was a young boy up to about age of nine, he lived in Upper St. Clair. If you know where what used to be the Bedner Farm, what's now the Bedner Estates, yeah. that's where the Borland family was in Upper St. Clair. That's where he lived his first nine years before moving to Cecil. He's got upper seas there rooms as well. They're also the bed nurseries. I have to remember, but uh, you know, 